Okay, well, well welcome to um, the, the business analyst uh, training on types, type and state configuration. And I used to call it type state until Carol asked me um, last night, can I just make sure there's a, it's clear that it's actually type configuration and state configuration. There's really two separate things, though so, uh, obviously interrelated. Um, it's not one thing. It's not type state. It's, it's actually two things that we're, we're going to be talking about there. Um, this is exactly the same PowerPoint that, that I went through and I did and I used for, um, to, to do the training on the de for the developers. Um, so there's going to be some, some really technical things in here. I'm going to try to you know, glance over that, the, the, the technical side of things um, and try to accentuate more the business side of the, the, the prospect, but it's just the same PowerPoint. So don't be worried if I sort of like glance over some certain things. Okay. Um, sort of the assumption here is that sort of everybody sort of has a basic understanding of um, you know our services that we're that we're doing, and I'm not saying you know everything about every little service, but basic understanding, you know why why we have services, what are the services, and quality student, you know go through the, going through the primer, um, and it basically understanding a little bit about what a class one service is and what a class two service is in, within quality student. Um, so it's just a, you know the, I'm going to sort of make a little few assumptions on that. So. Um, the, the reason why I'm putting this together is um, because types and states have been integral to Kuali Student you know, since, since almost since the beginning and the way that the, the original service team even had to started designing anything around Kuali Student. Um, and, and yet there's sort of been, sort of been confusion about what they are, how, how do you come up with types and states, and how do you manage them, and how, where they are, and what's going on. So um, at a lot of people's instigation, um, you know, I, I was asked to sort of put some things together here so that uh, especially that it becomes clear to everybody what they are and how to understand them and how to, how to think about them um, and sort of how to manage them a little bit. Um, the, the last thing is there's going to be a little bit of tiny connection that it's sort of, it is connected to the dictionary too. Um, but then we also want to have some more, more practical objectives. And so we'll sort of go through sort of what some of the meth methodology is about sort of well, how, how do you even think about defining an additional type or an additional state, or how to define new groupings of types and whatnot? So you know, want to get a little bit more also hands-on a little bit here too, not just sort of just theoretical stuff. So the first thing to talk about is is types, and um, when when quality student talks about types, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, the when I explain what they are, they're really just uh, a way of of grouping instances of objects into natural categories. Um, so in, in, if you're thinking of, uh, of species versus breed, you know, if species is, uh, is, you know, is the object, and, you know, then you have a dog, and the type of that object is you know, a Doberman or a, or a poodle or something like that. It's just a way of sort of categorizing, a, a, giving a little more nuance in terms of, of what that object is. And, and, and quality student, sort of the, the reason why we have types, or you know, the, the, is that in the in the in the past existing systems, they would have objects for let's say for example a course um, or or a major, but they were find people were finding more and more often that they were not able to define the some new learning um, uh, learning units or un learning I experiences using those fixed categories. So when Quali Student was designed, it was designed in order to allow for that ability to actually define, more, for more easily define um, these, these new learning experiences such as service learning or experiential learning or, or whatnot and still be able to then model them within the system um, but then still get some concreteness to them. So um, let me see, what is, whoops, whoops. So what is the case type? Um, so, so yeah, so, so that goes into the to the main reason why why chaos has types in the first place, and it's basically so so that we can extend what we're building and, and deploying out here um, in in the system, and just to make it a little bit easier there. Uh, so that in, in this example, um, you know, we have a, a credit course type, which is a, a learning unit. You know, we're released as part of an, uh, the curriculum management part of the process, which is I, I still call R one. Um, but this ser a new service learning type could then be added in by Maryland, um, University of Maryland, you know, to, to model some of their new experiential learning programs that they've got. So that's the real basic, that's the core reason why we did it. But, but, it, it, but these types apply to not just the, the learning units, which a lot of people have heard about. Um, it, was, it was applied to uh, almost all the objects that are in the system. 
Um, you know, I also want to bring up that you know types aren't completely unique to Quali Student. Um, you know, other other service-oriented projects uh, use them, um, and in fact, the, the Quali Rice does use them, but they use them to to sort of a lesser extent and sort of less formally. So, just as an example, if you look at the, the identity management services um, which come with Rice, they have things like affiliation types, and they have address types, and they have phone types. Um, and whatnot, and, and, and that is all to allow you to define, as you can think of, additional, let's say, additional addresses that didn't exist in, when they first designed the system, additional phone phone types, etc. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So th this is not, you know, unique to to Kuali Student. You know, we we've just taken them a, probably a little bit step forward further. They we seem to have them on almost every object. They have them on probably. Uh, you know, maybe a quarter of their objects or something like that. They have types on about a quarter of the things that they manipulate. So, um, so as I said, Quali Student, when <coughs> we create objects, um, we put a type and a state on on almost everything that that we design. It's sort of like, um, you know, when we when we're doing our service design work and we're sort of saying, okay, there's this thing called this object here, we just stick a type on there and we just stick a state on there, and we do that, you know, because what we found is that if we sort of assume this thing doesn't have a type or a state, then we, we end up getting hamstrung later on. And actually, we found out that um, in, in the examples that um, that if you design a, a, a with a, with one set of this object has these couple of types, very often we can then model additional functionality really easily just by adding another type. And so, in the example that I that I'm pointing out to here, you know, we have this this concept of a of a, of a LPR roster. LPR is basically is uh, is how you is a is a way how you attach a person to a learning experience in in the system, and so you have different roster types, and we could have we designed it originally originally for grade rosters, and then we said okay oh this also applies to wait lists and the hold until list that we we've got for registration, and we think it probably will also apply to to just generating class lists if people need to be able to order things in particular ways and whatnot. So the roster just just provides us that way, and we can then uh, add different. Um, Types of, of additional rosters for managing lists of students that are in, in courses and, and and in other types of programs, um, and it and it's been very useful. I'll just give you another example in the in the appointment service that we've uh, just created. Um, just as an example, we we had you know a, a different types that identified the, the different kinds of uh, appointment windows that we had, which basically drove what rules you had for generating the the appointment slots for a person for to, in order to get registered. And so then when we were coming along and we hit the, the epics um, and we started talking to the BAs about the epics that, that deal with, well, assigning a student a one-off slot, you know, a student walks in and says, oh, I'm late, how do I do it, or I, don't, I can't make my slot, um, how do I do that? And we just sort of said, oh, very simple, we add a, a new type, it's called the manual type, and here the, the generation of the, of, the, of the actual slots is, is manual. And so you don't have to prompt for any kind of rules about create, generating them. It just you know, sort of just type in the information, and, and there you go. So you can see that sort of it by, by by taking this sort of like assumption that we have types and states on the objects, we can it allows us to to actually design better and to actually cover more cases than the initial designs initially were were, were planned for. So extensibility is the main thing. Um, <clears throat> so well, what what can they do? When we say that you know we, oh we have this new type or whatever. What does it really? What does that mean? And what it really means is that you know you have an object which has different fields on it. So you have you know many people think about like rows in a spreadsheet, and you have different fields, different columns, and that's sort of one way BAs might want to think about it. Is you know each row is a is a is an object, and the column and each column is a field. And in, in, if you have one type of object, um, then often the fields um, you'll have the you, you'll if it's one type, you'll have a you have a field filled in, and it's another type, you won't have that field filled in. And so, just as an example, when we're talking about milestones, um, only holidays are the kinds of milestones that 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 make sense to even flag as whether or not they have instructional they are an instructional day or not. So that's a you know simple way of sort of managing that. Um, they're also used for being able to just you know sort of select the objects and manage them because again. They, they they define a natural. We, we try to get them to define a natural grouping that is that makes sense to to you all, to the business um, analysts, because that that's really what we're shooting for here. We're trying to sort of get get the categories and the groupings and the and the identifications that make sense for most of the business processing. So often you'll select a, 
uh, a bunch of them by type, and maybe you know by additional information, but type is one of those things that you'll go in. So you may just want to say, I want to display holidays on a, on a student calendar. Um, from, a, from a technical standpoint, we absolutely need the types so that we can define business rules just once, because we don't want to sit there and have to define a business rule that applies just to, let's say, the fall semester of you know, 2012. Um, and then have to rewrite that rule to have it cover the fall semester of 2013, and then write it yet again to cover the 2014. Instead, we want to be able to sort of just make it so it's sort of soft coded and say, you know, we want this rule to really apply to the drop date of whatever term you're in, and that way it, it can sort of do the lookup to find what the actual date is for that term and be able to do that manipulation. So types are absolutely crucial for that. Um, then the third thing, I mean the, I mean the final sort of thing that sort of in general these things do, and I'm just going to say because we haven't worked out the, the mechanism yet how it's actually going to be doing the mapping, but often the, the type often is what's used to drive the authorization. So that if you say, well, for this type of object, these are the people who can typically update that object. And for these types, it's these other people who can typically update the, the object. So, so that's what types sort of do. They sort of drive a lot of the... The, the, the processing and manipulation and things that, that can happen to that to that object. <clears throat> hey, hey Norm, can I yep. um, just interject uh, one thought sure. here, um, um, just to frame the, the training appropriately? Sure. To date on the project, type state definition has largely come out of services. Moving forward, it is a primarily a BA responsibility. So whether you're on core or whether you're part of the PDT, at this point moving forward, VAs will own type state definition. <clears throat> I see a couple of people sat up a little straight. Now you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not enough just to understand this generally. This is the work you're going to be doing, hence the training. So I just wanted to kind of set that expectation up front. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. So, so, so now, now maybe it's, you know, it's not just sort of you know, theoretical so much. It's sort of the idea is, is yeah, so when we come up with these types and, the, these types and states, it, it's important to, you know, to really own them, to really make them so that they, they are the natural categories that sort of match the way you think about the process and the way you think about the, the business that you're doing. And that's really, that's really important. Um, whoops, got a... Somebody hung up on the phone. Sorry, that's us for some reason. Somebody keeps trying to call our polycom. Sorry. Okay. So now th this is really more sort of a technical question, but I'll sort of breeze through it a, a little bit just sort of to make sure people understand. You know, but if you think about it, you know, sort of like um, if you think about it like the, the species or, you know, talk the analogy that I was bringing up, it's sort of, you know, you see the tree of life and, you, you know, the, you know, the origin and all, you know, the trace it down. You sort of think of it as a tree or a hierarchy or whatever. And so the quick question becomes to mind is, you know, is it, is it, are types hierarchical? Do you find one type and then you can find another type that's a subtype of that, et cetera, et cetera? And, and no, the, the quick answer is no, they're not. Um, you can sort of use groups to sort of get some of that effect. So what we did instead is we said, you know, instead of that, we'll, we'll allow you just to be able to group certain ones together. And by the naming, you can sort of make them sort of, you can sort of name something um, hierarchical. So for in the example with the, the holidays, you, you might want to, you might do something like, you know, holidays.instructional, holidays.noninstructional, or something along those lines, if you wanted to use that to, to capture it or, or group them together that way. Um, so so, so that, that's sort of the, the way you can sort of, you can sort of put them in different categories and different groups for different purposes. And, and they can be cross-cutting groups, like the, the, same, the same type can appear in multiple groups. And um, so, so it makes it so when you start thinking about it then, you know, because a lot of times people say, well, display me the holidays. Well, there is no, you know, no type called holiday, but there is a group that's called holidays. And then it maps to all of the, you know, the 4th of July holiday, the, you know, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, um, uh, you know, whatever other holidays that, you know, at least, at least we've done in, the, in America <laughs> defined, but we can also define more for the, for the rest of the places. And they would, the nice thing is we could just, we could have the code just say display all the holidays and those would map to whatever are, they are mapped to, um, the, the actual types, so that if you defined a whole different set, a different set of holidays that weren't North American, um, 
the code should still work because we're trying, you know, we're trying not to actually code the, we could code the rule against that grouping called holidays and not have it coded against, you know, the 4th of July, which of course only makes sense in, in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so, so again, you know, by, by using this ability to group things, you can get a, an awful lot of uh, ability to, you know, group things for display or, or to identify, you know, like types that for, for maybe defaulting purposes, for the, as the example is milestones that typically are all day or milestones that typically, you know, take a range of, of begin and end date. Um, and, and it's important to, you know, and this is services has not defined all the possible groups, but PDTs can. And I sort of wrote this a little bit before, <laughs> but um, it's not services, but it would actually be, you know, the, the sort of the core team. We're going to try to define as much as possible, you know, the, at least enough examples of, of the types and the groups and whatnot so that parallel development teams could actually then say, oh, okay, I get it. I can now add another group that sort of looks like this but does for this other purpose that we're doing. Um, and that certainly is exactly what we're hoping will happen is that especially parallel development teams will be able to sort of pick up and, and uh, define more groups, define additional types that weren't thought of during, during the, uh, you know, the quick move that we did to you know, actually get these services out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with types is, is as I said before, there's class one and class two services. Um, and so if you, if you look at it, the sort of these examples here is the class one services um, often will have a lot of different types, and that's sort of again to, sh to keep that flexibility. So we have the learning unit object, which you know can be a credit course or a course format or an activity, or a credential or a core or a major or whatever, and it just goes on. You know, quite a few, um, or an academic time period, which can sort of break down to a lot of different kinds of of uh, time period objects. Um, but when we move to the class two service. We, we're often hardening that, you know, one, one or just a few of those types and sort of giving, so we, we take what used to be a learning unit object, we say that this thing only deals with credit courses and it becomes a course object. Um, <clears throat> similarly with major discipline and program variation and whatnot. But it's, it's not necessarily a one for one, so it isn't, it isn't um, like we, you know, it's just a class two service is, a, a, you know, making concrete one of those types it's possible that it does a, a series of types. So a term object really, you know, can have a, a type that is either fall term, spring term, or summer term. So it isn't necessarily, the differences, you know, from this standpoint isn't necessarily a matter of, uh, uh, you know, exactly one or, you know, a really a strong difference. It's just a matter of degree that these ones, the class two servers typically don't represent lots of types or, or a wide variance of types in, the, in that case. So. Um, which, which then, you know, brings up the, the thing, why do you have them in, in class two services at all, especially the class two services like course? Um, so you saw it, it's, you know, they, they still have objects with types in them. Why? And uh, again, just going to keep repeating, the word is extensibility. We want these services to hold up for the long haul. And so what we sort of envision is that at some point somebody might want to, you know, use that course service to actually capture information on some non-credit courses. And to be, how are they going to distinguish between that? Well, they would put a different type in, into that type field. And so where it had been, it always was always credit course coming out of that. Now it may come out that you get it and it has actually non-credit courses, which may say you don't need certain types of fields that are on the screen because they, they don't need to have that additional inf information. And maybe then it also says we also, you know, we do need other information because the non-credit courses maybe need more, more information in the fee area than typically the credit courses do. But again, it's, a, it's, it's for extensibility. Um, so I'm going to pause for a second, and I just want to see if there's any questions on, on courses, I mean on, on, I mean on types, to see if people get a, you know, if they have questions about sort of what, what I'm talking about there and maybe clarifications before I plunge into states. Everybody's pretty quiet, Norm. Oh, they, there goes, hang on. There goes Mike. Could you? This is UMD, uh, Ken from UMD. I was wondering if you can explain the difference between an object and a service. Ah, uh, <clears throat> okay. A, 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 service, a service actually comprises of both um, uh, maybe a, a small set of objects and all the operations that are needed to manipulate those objects. So, for, for example, in the, in, in the, the um, the core service, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There are almost, I think there's only one real 
real big object in there. It's the coarse object. So that's so there it might get some confusion as to you know well they're the same thing, um, but if you actually look at the um, at the program service, the program service actually has separate objects for majors, minors, um, uh, credential programs. Uh, what is it? The specializations and things like that. And and it in the in the service then puts constraints about how those different objects are connected together, and it has operations for allowing you to not just create those objects, and, 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 but also how to how you can specify how they're connected together. So does that make sense? I think that was a yes. OK. OK. So I, I'm, I'll now plunge ahead and, and talk a little bit about states. Again, this is just to give you the, the idea of what are the states and why do we have them and what, what's, the, what's their purpose and whatnot, more, so more theoretical. Um, <clears throat> so if you talk about what is a state, it, it basically, the idea is that it defines you know, sort of where the object is within some sort of predefined life cycle. And I actually, I hate the word where, but it's the only one that fits. But it means it really is sort of when. It's sort of when in time or, you know, where it, but it, it sort of has a time component to the whole thing. Um, and so you can sort of see in the dog analogy, you know, it, it's, you can sort of say the states of a dog might be, you know, they're a puppy, they're an adolescent, they're an adult, they're, they're in old age, and then finally they're, they're dead. Um, and so it, similarly, for, for a course, you can sort of get the idea that a, that a course would, might go through the different states of, um, you know, it's, it's a draft, it's in a draft state, it's under review or in a proposal type state. Um, it's active, it's actually being, you know, it's, 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 it's in use and it's being able to be used. And then, you know, possibly, you know, it, it could be, um, you know, be retired. It, it's, it's, it's been, you know, um, put, put out the pasture or it's been whatever, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so the so again, it sort of does that, and it usually means that there are certain processes that are operating on that object to actually change that state. And and so what happens is is, is it's important to have you know these these states defined because it sort of goes through you know the entire life cycle of that object is that you know from from sort of birth to to death or whatever. Um, and it, it, and the states define you know expectations about what can be done with that object and what can't be done with that object. So again, you know, so in some sense, they have a similar type of, 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 of control level, level on the object, but, but it's, you know, and, and they sort of turn on off and thing, turn on off fields like types, but they have a sort of a different meaning of it then. You know, so if you turn off a field because it's, it's retired or something, it just means that you, know, you don't want to be able to update the thing once it's been in this state because it's, it's already been, been used and you don't want to change the title on the thing retroactively, things like that after it's been approved or whatnot. Um, so, so then, you know, so the, the, again, so again, the question is sort of, sort of like types, it can turn on and off fields. And so the idea is that when it's in draft, it becomes re required until it's actually approved and whatnot. Um, you know, you may not need certain pieces of information until later, uh, later on. Um, but it, it also controls access of the object. So again, you, you could have a business rule that says, you know, retired courses can still be printed on transcripts, but you can't use them for, you know, creating, you know, course offerings for new registrations. And again, so you, you, you want it, to, it sort of, it binds, it, it's bound to rules that then can manipulate the, you know, what can be done with that object. Um, you know, and similarly, a draft calendar shouldn't be displayed to students. We wait till at least it's been marked as approved before you would actually go ahead and, and, and display it. So, you know, that would be coded into, 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 you know, some sort of rule or in the application logic, so to say, you know, only pick the active ones in order to display. So that's the basic idea of what, what states are. Um, what, what I want to do is make clear what they aren't. Um, and this is because the, 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 the dif difference between what, what um, Kuali student has for states and what is, you know, what's in workflow was led to a ton of confusion and a lot of churn going on in when we did curriculum management. Um, and in fact, I, I don't, um, it really didn't completely get completely clarified to, to everyone, even on the, especially on the services team and everybody else, where, we're all, where was the boundary line here um, and, until um, Maryland finished our 1-2 and they were able to do some certain things about the, the workflow routing, which was like, yes, and that's, that means it was rightly belonged there in the first place. Um, so they're similar ideas, but they're different. 
Um, and that workflow typically works at a much more detailed level than does do the state's life cycle processing. And, and so again, you might have multiple uh, workflow controls, like maybe one process that operates on the object. The, the states talk about the life cycle of the object over multiple processes that then operate on it. And so I'm, I, sort of the, the way I tried to capture it is that a workflow will often be invoked and in, in, in will route for approval uh, some change that's proposed to, to be made to that object. And often that results in a change in the state of that object. So I'll just give, walk you through a quick example here, if you can sort of look at it. Um, you know, so when you first create the object, it might be in sort of a draft state, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, and there is no workflow right now about that, at least initially, possibly. You just sort of type in some information about the object, and you sort of, it's still draft. But then, let's say you want to you now submit it for approval um, as a new course, then you would actually enter a workflow, and you would connect it to a workflow object, and you create a proposal for a new, uh, a new course. And it would route then to the department for approval, maybe to a, the school to approval, and then eventually to the university, you know, wide approval or whatever. And then, and it would, it would go through all those nodes, and it wouldn't typically update the lifecycle because it really hasn't changed, you know, the, the the core thing. It's really in that proposed state in the lifecycle. It isn't until it gets the final approval at the university level then then the workflow would actually reach back in and it would then mark the, the state of the object as approved, as now approved. Um, and then the workflow would basically go away, but the object around and would live for a long time. And it would then be used for being offered for courses and whatnot, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't update anything. It would just sort of mark, okay, it's an approved course, and you sort of you know, offer it. And then somewhere along, uh, uh, some, sometime later it would go along and uh, somebody would say, okay, look, we don't want to be teaching this course anymore. And, um, somebody might then submit a proposal to retire it. Now, at that point, it's still an approved course. It hasn't really changed the, you know, the, the, the state of that object yet, but we have a, a proposal, a workflow proposal going out to re retire it, and it would also then route through all the nodes for approval. And not until it finally reached that final approval state would it reach back in and mark it as retired. Um, and again, just so you can sort of see that it's the workflow proposals that then that then are really designed to operate on on and change the states of the life cycles often. So that that makes that clear. Um, so now I've been talking about this idea of a life cycle, and uh, and it, it, it just was a loose term, but I wanted to give a little more more strength to what that means. Hello. There we go. So I'm going I'm to sort of give a more of a, a, a techie definition, which is it's just a collection of states, <laughs> and it's just really simple. It just it's just a collection of states that apply to a particular object. Um, a bag of states is, is sort of one one way of thinking about it. And the the I the in the simplest case, if you have you know like I said, we put types and states on almost everything. Most of the objects in the system just have really simple states. It's either active or inactive. Um, and it, that's all there is. There's, there's, there's no, nothing else involved in it. Um, and so the, the, you know, the, the, the object then has just a single life cycle, and that life cycle just has two states. Um, if we sort of look, though, and we look at some of the more complex objects, especially the ones that really are, are heavily involved in, in sort of what we do in, in our business as, you know, uh, uh, student system administrators. It's it's sort of the ones that that involve actually managing and manipulating, um, you know, those big objects. And so I just have an example here where where you know the we're talking about the LPR, which is which is the is the learning unit to person relationship, and that's sort of where it manages um, the relationship between you know say a, a course and a student who takes that course, or it manages the the instructors who are assigned to that course or the advisors that are connected to a program, or a student that's enrolled in a particular program. Um, and so if you, sit, if you look at it from that way, we, an LPR actually has four different life cycles, or four different bags of states that are associated with it. And so one life cycle is you know, the one that captures the, the sort of the, the, the life cycle, or the, you know, the, the, the set of states that match a student's uh, course registration. So it would be like planned, registered, and, and dropped. 
And but an instructor assignment to a course is a little different. You know, they may tentatively assign them to the course, and then they'll mark them as yeah, they're assigned, and then or they may be they'll unassign them later on. Say, oh yeah, you're you're no longer involved in that course. And you know, and, and you know, these aren't these aren't you know vetted because we haven't actually gotten to the instructor part yet. But that's the kind of thing. So you can see that they're very different in terms of the 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 meaning of of what it means. You know, for a student to be registered in the course is you don't say you don't say that an instructor is registered in the course. You know, it says they're assigned to teach the course, and it has a different meaning too. And so, and there's different 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 number you often know, different numbers and different controls that that apply during different states. Um, and then you know, in the student program, you can see you know even very different. It's you know applied, admitted, en enrolled, withdrawn, and I bet there's even a bunch more states if you actually start thinking about the actual program enrollment process, and which we haven't done a lot of, but that's the kind of thing that we go through. And then, of course, an advisor, you know, and you know, and we haven't done the analysis on this, but it's unless, at least in, in the experience that I've seen in most places, you know, it's either the advisor is an advisor to the program or they're not, you know. So again, that sort of devolves down to a very simple life cycle for that kind of a thing. All right, um, and and this is this is more of a techie diagram, but it's the it's the it's the state entity diagram. It sort of just shows you the relationship. I, I'm throwing it up here if you want to take a look. Um, you know, go ahead and, and, and drill down. It's for people who like to learn this kind of stuff more, more with diagrams and, and visually. So, um, but it gives you that kind of stuff. All right. Um, and, and just so, again to under, underscore that the VA should be able to read those diagrams without any problem. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But it's the you know uh, optional but, for SMEs. <laughs> no, optional yeah. for SMEs. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Thanks. But it sort of give, this does give you a sense of, of how it's actually connected. Oh, and I just want, but it does point out one thing, and I just want to just, and I forgot about that, so it's good that I, that I paused and went back. You sort of see the dotted line here. If you sort of see the dotted line that, that connects the type of the object to the actual life cycle, which is really the bag of states, it's really just dotted that there is no, no connection, direct connection between the type of the, the, type of the object and, um, and the life cycle. So, you know, even if you have the type of the object, you know, as we, as we saw, it may be there, there's, um, there's one life cycle no matter what, how, what the type of the object, or there may be one life cycle for each t different type of the object, or maybe one life cycle for this collection or grouping of types for the, of the object. So terms would typically have a, have a similar life cycle, whether they're fall or spring. Even though they're different types, you know, fall is, is, is close enough to what a term, uh, you know, a, a uh, uh, fall and spring are close enough that they follow the same sort of life cycle process. Um, so just to let you know that and there's not a hard connection, at least we haven't designed because we haven't found the need for that yet. Typically, you know, the program knows what life cycle they're working in, and they can sort of say, okay, this is then the states of that, you know, that somebody could then transition this object from. So they can, you know, they know to change it from draft to submitted or waitlisted to enrolled or something like that. Um, so. I'm going to ask the same question about you know rice, and does it have states? And the answer there, though, is that it doesn't. Um, but they do have the idea of a state, in that most of rice's objects. And the reason why I bring up rice is is because we are actually using rice for you know for the identity service. So if you look at a person in, in the identity service that uh, that rice has, they they don't have a way of tracking a full you know, state of that person. They just sort of have a way of saying, hey, are they active at the university or not? Um, there's no sort of, you know, gradations or to show that this is, um, you know, where, where they might fall in or, or not. And similar with, you know, the other kinds of objects that they have. Because they, they just, it's just a simple binary flag, yes or no. Um, we actually talk with Rice about this. And, you know, again, maybe their objects are, are simpler and, and they don't always need much more, and so they just they looked at it, and maybe that they just they also said that it was just going to be too hard to make changes, and it's given that a lot of their code was based on this true false all the time, um, and so they they decided not to implement states. But you know, at least let you know that that they have something similar, and it's not completely you know completely uh, foreign to the idea for them. It's really a lot of the, the same idea. So, um, okay, so I'm going to pause again and sort of ask if there's. Some other questions on states? Here comes one. So, so are there any special relationships between versions and states? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by versions. Like the version of a course, you mean? 
Oh, uh, yeah, of an object, I guess. You had to ask that, Bob. <laughs> Happy? Uh, <laughs> a little bit of a loaded question, but we can follow up on the work that we did related to course versions because there are some um, constraints or restrictions on within a course what versions, how many versions can be in what state at a time. Is that what you're going for? Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, it, it, we we can follow up on that. I don't think it's a topic for right here, but if there's if there's more than that, we sh we should talk about that. She actually probably answered it better than I could. So on that one, a any other ones to stump me with? No, I mean in that ER diagram. There's an object called a ref object URI. Is that something we should know yeah. about? Um, no, it, it's just a, a technical name for saying, you know, that this is a, uh, trying to make the distinction between this is a course object as opposed to the actual object itself, which is the, let's say, you know, the English 101 version of that, of that object. And that's the only difference. Um, it's, it's technical because it's just how, how we're trying to, in, in web services, that's why it, it's a uniform resource I indicator. So that's really what that is. Uniform resource indicator. But it's it's really just named after the 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 service and um, the object then of, of that. So if it's a if it's a course, then it's a it's the name it's a course service plus the, the course object, and that's what that thing is. So it's uniquely identified. Okay. Did, did that answer that well enough? Right. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay.